Maybe before social media came along, you could live a day in your Christian life blissfully unaware that there are Christians who disagree with one another over various issues of Bible interpretation and conscience. Now you can hardly go 10 minutes. I've even had to explain to my young children now many times that good Christians can disagree on certain issues. But which ones? Which issues are matters of indifference? Issues where believers can treat each other with Romans 14 grace? And which are matters of consequence? Issues over which we must do what Paul told the Thessalonians to do when he said, we command you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. That's 2 Thessalonians 3.6 from the ESV. These are tough questions. How do we apply the Bible to issues of conscience. You do it in part by reaching out for wisdom to people who've written on this very topic, including my longtime friend, Dr. Andy Nacelli. This second season of the Bible Study Magazine podcast is focused on application of scripture, and I think you'll find Dr. Nacelli's careful biblical words to be helpful on touchy topics. Welcome to the Bible Study Magazine podcast season two. I've got my longtime friend on the podcast today, Andy Nacelli, Dr. Andy Nacelli. It's really a privilege to have him on the show and to get to fellowship with him again. We're talking in this season about application, applying the Bible to our lives. And Andy, along with another friend of mine, J.D. Crowley, a missionary to Cambodia, wrote a book a few years back about the conscience. I wanted to talk about that with Andy. Andy, tell us a little bit about who you are and where you are where you serve in Christ's body. Sure. My name is Andy Nacelli, married to Jenny, going on about 16 years. We have four daughters, and we live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I teach systematic theology, New Testament, and ethics at Bethlehem College and Seminary. And that school is a church-based school out of Bethlehem Baptist Church, and I serve as one of the pastors of that church. Um, most people know that church because John Piper was pastor there for over 30 years. He's the chancellor of our school. So we love we love being part of this ministry. I have a question before we get into talking more about Bible application. I was just curious. I never asked you this. How did you end up getting together with J.D. Crowley to write this book on conscience? Yeah, I think what happened, we first connected. Uh, there's a, a school that doesn't exist anymore. It was called Northland uh, Baptist Bible College and Northland University. University. Yes, yeah. yes. So they had this thing called the Heart Conference um, in the middle of the winter where people would come up there for a conference. And we were both speakers. And I was, I was speaking on, I think, the gospel or something. And he was speaking on conscience in a breakout. My wife and I were listening and thought, this is fantastic. I've been thinking about these very things. So we, we got together and we talked and shared our stories. And as I percolated on that, I, I approached him later and said, hey, would you be interested in and collaborating on this. So that's that's how that came about. He's a godly man. He's he's a generation sure. ahead of me. He's got decades of experience on the mission field. So gracious, so wise. So the book would not be what it is without him. Which makes it especially valuable, that, that experience on the mission field, because cross-cultural issues of conscience, of course, they come up in the New Testament. I mean, that's kind of what we've got going with Jew-Gentile relations in Romans 14 and other passages. Well, let's jump right in then to Bible application when it comes to matters of conscience. Tell us, how did you define conscience in your book, and how can a Bible student discover the answer to that question? Yeah. So, I'm looking for a, a prop. Okay, this is a water bottle. I love water bottles. I've got four or five of these babies. I got them all over the place. It's, uh, so, if I were like 100 years from now trying to figure out what is a water bottle, I know that's two words, but let's say when they occur together, what's a water bottle, and I didn't know what it was ahead of time. Now, I, I could have, say, a list of a couple hundred sentences that use water bottle in it. And I could say, all right, so that's a noun, it's a thing. So let's see, what, when that noun is used, are there any words that describe it? We call those adjectives. Are there any verbs that go with it? Actions, like can you, what can you do with it? What can people do with it? Uh, and I could compile those together and figure out how, how is this word, how do people use this word in context at a certain point in time? And that will give me a sense. And I could figure out things like, well, water bottles 
can be hard. They can break. Uh, you can drink from them. They can be cheaper, expensive. Uh, you can wash them. You can drop them. Like you, you, you kind of figure out what, what it is when you see how it's used in sentences. So when it comes to a word like conscience, it's the, the Greek word synatesis, uh, there It occurs about 30 times in the New Testament. So my starting point was to say, let's look at every one of those occurrences and analyze them and figure out just what I did with the water bottle and see if that helps. And it does. So you can figure out, so a, a conscience, the conscience can be, be certain things or descriptions, like it can be bad or good. And there are all these words for how it can be evil, like evil and, and, and weak and wounded and defiled. Uh, and then for the good side, it can be good or, or, or cleansed or pure. And, and so that's helpful. And then you can see what can you, can you do with it? And you can accuse, uh, you can uh, live in a way that goes against it or, or not, and that's sinful or not. You, you pile all it up and then you say, okay, so now I need to define it. So my, my attempt to define it in a memorable way is that your conscience is your consciousness or your awareness, your sense of what you believe is right and wrong. And then I unpack that throughout the rest of the book. So Yeah, um, that was very helpful at the very, very beginning of the book, just going through all of the passages where conscience is mentioned. You definitely drew on that principle, usage determines meaning, which is just a basic principle of language and therefore of reading. And yet, um, I, you suggested that that's a place to start. Um, it's maybe not everything you can do in your Bible study. What else can you do? Is, is word study all you need to do to understand what the conscience is? No, uh, it's it's a necessary starting point. Um, but a, as you're doing a word study, you encounter resources that kind of snowball. Um, the one that you're familiar with is, is BDAG. It's Bauer, Denker, Art, and Gingrich. It's the premier lexicon or dictionary for Greek of the Old Test of Greek of the New Testament times, uh, both in the New Testament and non-New Testament literature. So you can start with that and then follow up references. And then you have to ask the question, so we're dealing with Bible. So does this word occur in the Old Testament? Uh, and and there's a the Greek translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint. And interestingly, Sunatasis doesn't translate uh, a Hebrew word that carries over one for one. There are a lot of words like that where it, the, the Hebrew word and the Greek word kind of pair up. And there's not one for Sunatasis. The closest is the Hebrew word lave, heart, like when David's heart uh, convicted him. His heart smote him, the King James says. That's how I almost said smoke, but I know you're the King James guy. Uh -huh. um, so uh, that so that that's helpful. So you kind of broaden out that way, but then you have to broaden out theologically, and and just ask. So what are the the New Testament writers doing with this concept in their literary con context? What's their theological use? How are they applying it? And that just gets you in all kinds of realms of of practical theology. So. It, the word study is a good starting point. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about some of the passages that you brought up that, uh, of course, anybody who's dove in, dived in, boy, that's a tough one. I don't know what the King James would say, into matters of conscience, <laughs> knows that Romans 2 is really important. And yet, right. unless I'm right. uh, not remembering right, Romans 2, 14 and 15 don't use the word conscience and yet are absolutely essential Actually, to our it understanding. Does. It does. does it? What does it say? Um, I'm going I'm by memory it here. Basically... So Romans 2 uh, verses 14 to 6, 16. Well, 6 to 11 is a unit. Okay. It's, a, it's a chiasm. And then 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 is a unit. And there's a debate here. Uh, Stephen, Tom Schreiner, and Doug Moot disagree on this. Is it talking about a person who is a Christian who's keeping the law by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, like Romans 1, 8, 1 to 4? Or is this, uh, this do-gooder a theoretical person? Uh, a, a non-Christian actually who doesn't keep the law. And it's like a, so either way, I think what that pastor is saying is the conscience is one of the mechanisms that condemns you and shows that God's judgment is right. Right. So there you go. I, I discovered my error. I'm looking at the ESV right here, Romans 2.15, and I had my 
I had in my mind's eye this phrase, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. That doesn't use the word conscience, but that's clearly the conscience. And one of the reasons that you know that it is, is that the next phrase comes right along. And with this, something we call contextual redundancy, helping us right. understand like right. those collocations you were talking about, words yeah. that are used close by. Right. It says, while their conscience also bears witness right. and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The, the conscience is then the law of God written on the heart. Okay, we've got, done some Bible study here, and that's a major focus of the Bible Study Magazine podcast. We don't want to just feed answers to people. We want to provide some kind of methodology that people can use to arrive at answers for themselves when they read the Bible. Now, you talked in your book, which I really enjoyed reading, and to my shame and embarrassment, hadn't read until I had this impetus. I've been wanting to. I started it a couple months ago, and I thought, I'm going to get Andy on the show, so I have to read his book. You talked very frankly and self deprecating, I would say, about your own journeys through conscience issues, mm -hmm. some of which might surprise readers who didn't grow up in some of the Christian subcultures yep. that both you and I mm -hmm. were landing in when we were young. And as, as far as where you land as an adult and where JD lands as an adult, we're just in very similar places, you and I. And I too have wrestled really deeply through how to apply scripture to matters of conscience. I've, I've just really been doing this at least since my teenage years. You said that in your book, whether it's you or JD, I'm just gonna make the you plural from now on, okay? You said that educating the conscience on a particular issue might take years, and I've seen that happen, but do you really think God intended for living in obedience to his word to require such deep and sometimes long-term struggles over matters of conscience in applying the Bible? When you say, did God intend it? Yeah. Well, that's the way it is, so yes. So whatever happens is God's intention to one degree, but in another sense uh, is if it's because of sin, it's not the way it's supposed to be. So it is a result of sin, and that's why we have to do it. Yeah. You, you make me think of uh, right behind the camera here in my office, I've got my John Piper books and I am taking some guys in my church through the pleasures of God. And he has this really famous appendix, are there two wills in God? Um, there's his decretive will and his preceptive will, as some people have put it. And you're saying that, yes, the way God has ordered the cosmos because of sin, we are going to have to face these conscience issues. But did God, in you know, is this the ideal set of circumstances? Is, is this the way it's always going to be when Christ fixes the world? And I guess you're saying no. So will we have consciences in the new heaven and the new earth? Yes, I think every person has a conscience, including God. Remember, it's your it's your sense of what you believe is right and wrong. So everyone has a conscience, and for fallen people, for sinners. Their consciences aren't perfect like God's is. But when God gives us a glorified body, our consciences will be fully aligned with God's will. And these, these conscience matters won't be matters of contention between God's people. Praise God, and I look forward to that day. Um, you have in your book a concept that I've seen popping up uh, over the years, and I think one of the Ortland brothers and I too often get them mixed up. Gavin just wrote a book on theological triage. Exactly. Yep. You talk mm -hmm. about theological triage, which mm -hmm. is an idea I first heard from Al Mohler. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a metaphor that's just helpful to remember. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about theological triage. What are yeah. the levels? Okay, so before I explain the levels, it's going to sound a little subjective. Let me just prove biblically that it's, we have grounds for distinguishing levels. And I'd go to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, I'm writing to you what is of first importance when he's talking about the gospel. He, that's his word, first importance. So that implies that there are other important things that are not first. There are weightier so, matters of the law, as right, Jesus put it. Right, So that's another way to, to unpack it. So that means some everything the Bible says is true and important and valuable, and we should treasure it. But some things that the Bible says are more important than others. All right, so that, that's a hard pill for some people to swallow, but that's, I mean, first importance right there in 1 Corinthians 15. So then the question becomes, how do I distinguish first importance from, let's say, second or third. And the way to do that, well, Gavin Ortland just wrote a whole book on this. It's, it's really well done. He has 
four levels that he works through. But basically, what's most tied to the gospel? What's most most tied to what is essential for being a genuine Christ follower? I put it level one, meaning uh, something at the level one statement would be it, you can't knowingly deny it and in any meaningful sense be a Christian. Like to say, I don't believe in God. Uh, I'd have a hard time saying, well, I don't. Uh, you're a Christian. I mean, that's just so fundamental to Christianity is affirming that there's a God. And we could get more more specific with, well, Jesus is God. And more specific, you have to trust in Jesus alone to save you and not rely on your own good works. And we could go on with what, what would go in that bucket. Uh, what Moeller does in his article is, is lay out that first level clearly. And then he suggests we could think of a second and third level, the second being what's, what's really helpful for the health of a local church. Like it'd be hard for me to church plant with a Presbyterian brother, uh, just because I'm a Baptist. And we would have some differences there in how that works out. But I totally affirm he's a Christian. We have so much in common, and we can join ranks and all sorts of things, just not church planting. Uh, so there are certain second level issues that are local church uh, based for in their importance. And then for the third level, would be not unimportant but not so important that the church leaders or church members must agree to be able to be members of the same church. And that's really what matters of conscience would address. One way I've pictured theological triage is you've got your universal church, your body of Christ, and you're either in or out, it's sheep or goat. And like you said, there are fundamental beliefs that are required for everybody who's in. Um, and then you've got the local church, the second level, where to be in a credo Baptist church, like the ones that you and I attend, you've got to believe in believer's baptism. I'm not here to condemn uh, pedo baptism. I understand better now, I think, than ever as the years have passed, why my good brothers in Christ disagree with me on this thing. But practically speaking, when I've seen the very few people who tried to live it out, you know, their disagreement within a local church body, it just doesn't work. Uh, but then this third level, is again within that local church body things that we can disagree on and Lord willing still get along together. I believe that Tyndale's plowboy, the average person, should have the Bible in contemporary language. That Bible translations, therefore, are key tools for the Great Commission that Christ gave us to disciple the nations, to teach them to observe everything Christ has commanded us. I believe that regular Christians can and must read and study their Bibles on their own. I believe that we're not on our own, that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. And I believe that one of the Spirit's most important tools for doing this is other human teachers, despite our own failures. I believe in Bible study. And all this is why I find myself constantly turning to Logos Bible software and all my work. It makes the Bible text accessible to me at a level of detail I just don't get elsewhere. And it also gives me quick and inexpensive access to the work of many, many careful Bible teachers. The new Logos 9 now makes it even easier for me to do this. And I want to show you what I mean. If I type in any Bible passage into the passage guide, I get a prioritized list of links to all my commentaries. Logos 9 is all about small improvements that add up to something bigger. And now, in this new release, Logos 9, Logos gives me extra information about all my many commentaries, including even what denomination their authors come from. This is information that does help me in my Bible study. I'm all the time doing this, checking on my commentators, getting help from them, understanding scripture. Logos 9 has other small but big improvements like dark mode for all you dark mode people out there. I'll never understand you, but more power to you. It has the totally revamped fact book, a great place to start your study on all kinds of biblical topics. Christianity can get unmoored from the Bible and what a horror it is when that happens. Don't let it happen to you. Use the best Bible study tools there are. Use Logos 9. Go to logos.com and check out some of our base packages. Download our mobile app and start using the tools there. If you listen to a podcast about Bible study, you're probably pretty serious about it. You should not remain content with the free resources available on the internet. Check out the new Logos 9. I actually want to get topical here. And 
This is tough because when we're right in the thick of issues that are roiling the Christian community right now, it's hard to be objective, but I want you to help us try to step back and think about how to think about this particular issue. And, and here it is. Um, I'm going to quote you at some length, and then I'm going to go into a long question. So stay with me for a okay, second. I'm with you. You wrote, when we say that you need to calibrate your conscience by informing your conscience with truth, we mean primarily the truth of the Bible. Bible. Okay, so far so good. I'm with you. I'm sure Christians are. But it's not solely truth that appears in the Bible that needs to calibrate your conscience, you write. Sometimes our conscience is mistaken because we've applied biblical principles the wrong way due to being misinformed about truth outside the Bible. For example, you give in your book, you might think that a particular form of birth control is acceptable, but later you find out that it's an abortifacient. It actually causes the death of the unborn child. So when we form convictions, you write, about what we believe is right and wrong, we have to take into account truth in two spheres, truth inside the Bible and truth outside the Bible. Okay, so let's, let's take those categories. My own work for the last couple years has focused on helping Bible readers look carefully at the truth that is outside the Bible, namely what happens in English Bible translation when language changes over time. Um, but here's the topical issue. My conscience is troubled right now by the words and viewpoints of some other Christians with whom I want to maintain Christian unity, even within uh, local church bodies, and I want your help. There are many Christians I know who feel conscience-bound right now to alert their social media uh, friends to the conspiracy that they believe is now holding our nation in its grip, and I'm talking about the coronavirus. The Bible doesn't tell us whether there is a coronavirus right now or not, okay? I think everybody would agree on that. So we have to look to truth outside of the Bible, for example, to the Centers for Disease Control or to media outlets that are telling us what the Centers for Disease Control and other national you know, governmental bodies are saying about what's happening in their nations. I see Christians divided over, uh, over the issue of who do I trust? And I, I smell conscience-related issues in there. Someone okay. looks at the CDC and their conscience says, no, I, I can't trust that. I trust this other source of information here. And people are actually coming to internet blows about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to take a side. I could guess what side you land on. You can guess what side I land on by what I've just said. Uh, I think I've just pretty much revealed it. But help us think through how to think about a difference like this. Or, or is, is it not a conscience issue? When I'm looking at some truth outside the Bible, how do I handle this? Well, let me start by just showing my cards. I believe that uh, I can simultaneously be someone who takes the coronavirus very seriously and want to care for the health of people around me, especially those who are most vulnerable, and therefore make cautious steps that restrict my liberty accordingly. I believe that. Also, I'm very concerned about the economic disaster that's happening and, and affecting thousands and thousands of people in our country. And I'm also concerned that uh, authoritarian government policies could expand. All three of those can be true for the same person. That's where I am. Okay, so and I, I, I'm right I, there with you. All right, so just want to get that out on the board. Now, to get to your question about about uh, conscience, um, that means when I interact with folks in our church, for example, uh, we're we're in Minnesota, and our governor just this week announced that the stay-at-home thing he he's relaxing a little bit, so now we can m meet in groups of up to ten. So, our we've got. Uh, lots of people in our church. Uh, I think it needs to hit to about 250 or so until we can move it to like three or four services and our, our campus can all meet. So we're that we got to wait a while. But when that happens, there will I can just guarantee there will be people in our church who are like, finally, this has been so ridiculous and foolish. Right? We're coming in and don't tell me to wear a mask. There'll be some people who feel that way. Some others will be thinking, you're going to still assemble. But, but what if X, Y, Z, and they don't think it's wise, and then it's, and everything in between. Uh, so how do we shepherd them? Well, I think I think we have to be careful that we don't have a cavalier attitude that would trample the consciences of people who think, wait a second, it's not loving our neighbor if we just act like everything's normal and we we don't take into account how we could 
cause someone's death. That's serious. So that, uh, this is a conscience issue. Now, I'm not going to say that's a weak conscience or a strong conscience. I don't, it's just not tied close enough to the Bible to know because I don't, I don't know the, the answers here. But what I do know is it's, it's someone's real conscience. And therefore, we need to treat it with love. Treat, treat people with love who, who, who think those things. Which means we're going to probably be restricting our liberties in various ways for a little while. And that's okay. And we're going to do it uh, with a smile. And yes, it's frustrating, uh, aggravating, and all that. But we, just, we don't want to let our opinions about a virus divide the unity that we have in Christ. That would be so so sad, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's something that's particularly grievous to me right now. I, I have differing opinions with other Christians on Facebook, okay? That's going to be the case, I'm sure, from now till the eschaton, as long as Facebook <laughs> is in existence. But um, I very carefully select the issues that I know, you know, divide my friends before I ever post on them. It tends to be pretty rare. I tend to, uh, and, and when I do, I want to be as careful and gracious as possible. I'm, I'm trying not to just raise a flag that, you know, people can rally around, but I actually am trying to be blessed are the peacemakers when I'm doing that. I'm sure that I fail, but I'm concerned that there are Christians who don't even try. They assume that this is the only way to see things. But I, I think well, one thing that you had me doing as I was reading your book is just pushing my mind through Romans 14. And let's see if you like the way I put this, uh, and then you can expatiate on it. Um, uh, seminary professors expatiate. The rest of us just explain. Yeah, I don't um, know that word, but I think I know what it means. Now you do. How you use it. Yeah, from context, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. What? What can? Who expatiates? Seminary professors. Now we know. Okay. <laughs> As I was pushing my mind through Romans 14 with your help, and of course it's a passage I've looked at before, I really noticed what I would call the delicate dance that Paul goes through there. So he brings up these categories, strong and weak, that I think you guys, you and JD, very perceptively noted. Okay, for him to use the word strong and the, use, the word weak it means he's at least implicitly favoring the consciences of the strong putting himself on that side. And yet, he doesn't say, you strong, go out and convert the weak to make them think like you. He says that we've got to accept and welcome one another. He's prepared for that strong and weak category, at least on a given issue. You know, on another issue, it might actually be opposite for two people. Um, he's prepared to let that difference remain over the long term. That's going to be true in my church then. We're going to have people whose political views on how to apply biblical principles we agree on, th they differ. And people whose consciences about kind of classic lifestyle issues differ. Um, by pushing my mind through Romans 14, that's actually what leads me to want to be a peacemaker and not let division occur over these things as long as I can build a parallel to Romans 14 and say this is a Romans 14 conscience issue and not an absolute, you know, right or wrong biblical issue. Am I thinking about this passage yeah, the way you did? Absolutely. Yes. Um, a couple comments to reply to that. Uh, in Romans 14, Paul's main concern is not to try to get everyone to come to the same theological conclusion for a third level issue. That matters. I mean, he, uh, by using the word strong and weak, he's implying strong is better. But his main concern is that God's people learn to live in a deferring, loving, unselfish way with each other. And all throughout the passage, that, that's what matters. It's not convince them that you're right. So you, you, you got that part. Now, the qualification I'd like to make is that there's so much talk in our circles these days about theological triage and what we've just been discussing, that that can lead some people to apply it in a way that I think would be wrong, to misapply it to second level and even first level issues. So an example, I, I just wrote a long book review article on Amy Bird's book called Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. So I wrote a very lengthy article critiquing her view of the role of men and women in the church. And I, I respect her as a sister in Christ, but I don't consider what she wrote to be a third level issue. I'd put it as a second level issue. And I, I disagreed at length. Now, some people might think that's a third level issue. You shouldn't be doing that. So that's where distinguishing between what's first, second, third can get tricky because uh, uh, people will, will debate that very thing is how do you know what goes in which? Yeah, that was actually one of my questions. Well, you better answer it. Like, how do you know what goes in which? Well, 
when uh, Gavin Ortland was writing his book on theological triage, I saw a draft of it and we corresponded. And I said, uh, could you include a section or on, on theological triage for ethics, uh, ethical issues, and, and, and weighing them that way? And he's like, ah, not my book. This, was, this is on doctrine. That, that's the one that I, I think is the pressing issue. Uh, and I don't have a, a list to give you of how to do this. It's a more of a theological intuition where it that comes from just soaking in scripture, doing pastoral ministry, uh, and, and, and asking the Lord for guidance in the context of, of a church. And could so I, I don't, I don't have a, go ahead. Could I add one to your list? Living, yeah. maybe two, living both within the time that you're living in. Okay. And living within the tradition that you live in, both of which inform yeah. Me, yeah. I, I know, inform you too as to what am I going to treat as important. You know, in 1571, gender issues were not, you know, at the forefront of cultural debates. Right now, they are, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor. In sickness and in health, we got to go through these things and examine what the Bible says, learn how to apply them as husbands, as fathers, as church leaders. And so that's my culture. And then my tradition. Um, it, in general, I'm looking for the tradition that is the healthiest one at reading and applying the Bible carefully. And uh, I'm going to start there as a baseline. Um, th those are some of the things that I would just toss in. Yeah. I presume you agree. I, by the way, you mentioned earlier my, my background that, and that you share, uh, you didn't use the word fundamentalism, but that's, it's a, a good kind of fundamentalism as part of our background. Uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed this. So often I read uh, evangelicals refer to fundamentalism as people who, by definition, treat everything as a first level issue. Right. That they are, they are unable to distinguish between them and they, everything's a, a hill to die on. Right. And whenever that happens, if it's in person, I call them on it. If it's in a book, I, stri I strike it out. I mean, the, the whole concept, the word fundamentalist right. means essentialist, yeah. like first levelist. That they're doing triage before other people are doing triage. They, they got it. The question is, are they doing it well, responsibly? Are they adding too many things at the first level? But the idea of, of leveling, that that's part of fundamentalism at its core. Yeah, and uh, speaking of my tradition, I've always felt like, um, and you know, you've got certainly some parallels here because we both went to the same PhD program. Um, I felt like the revivalist tradition and the Princetonian tradition kind of combined in my formation there. And um, one of the one of the values of the revivalist fundamentalist tradition going back to the early part of the 20th century was that that fundamentalist modernist controversy actually brought evangelicals, I mean, in that etymological sense, people who loved and believed the, the gospel and the Bible, mm -hmm. brought them together, you know, apart from denominational distinctives. And mm -hmm. our alma mater for our PhD, your first of two, my only one, Bob Jones, um, was formed at a time when Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists That's recognized right. that they shared some things that were much more important than the things that divided them. That's right. And I felt like that multi-denominational, non-denominational DNA has been really helpful for me. I, I've always felt a unity with other true evangelicals in, in part because of that fundamentalist heritage. So if people are hyper-separatist, you've talked about that in another book that you uh, – edited years ago, um, then they're, they're missing that key part of the fundamentalist DNA. Right. Right. Yeah. We could go on and on and on about <laughs> our heritage, Andy. And, um, I think that, okay, so we've just been positive about it. Let, let's be a little, you know, critical of people that we love and you got to be so gentle and careful and gracious. Well, go yeah, ahead. Before you even go there, the thing is, it's not just people in the fundamentalist tradition who can sin this way. Right. I mean, I, I'm now not in that tradition. I'm in a conservative evangelical church context and school context. And there's a, I'd call it a reverse fundamentalism that happens all the time. So it's just, it's just, it's, it's not just fundamentalists. So the, the sin that I'm talking about is when you are so locked in on a third level issue that you think is the right way, it's God's way, uh, and, and everything else is sinful. And you, you hold so tightly to that, that anyone who, who, who veers off in any way from that view, you separate from. And, and separation today can look like shunning on Twitter or social media. It can look like uh, going out of your way to say, don't associate with that person. Don't like his comment. Don't like this. Don't retweet that. Don't go speak at a conference with that guy. That happens all the time. 
in, in conservative evangelicalism. Uh, so the, it, I just want to say it's, it's not just fundamentalism. So sure. go ahead. Well, actually, in, in a way, yeah. you just answered my question because critical of people that we love includes a self-criticism of the people that we're currently allied with in whatever churches and institutions that we share. And yes, I have seen the very same phenomenon. People who take a third level issue and, and make it a second or even sometimes, usually it's not made into a first level issue, but often into a second level issue. And I'm really struck by, and I wonder, I didn't, I didn't happen to catch this in your book and maybe I went you know, right past it, but Galatians 5, I was writing about this for sixth graders. Um, the fruits of the spirit are preceded by works of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to categorize these and I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, mm -hmm. The I was not surprised to see about five of the, I don't know, 13 or 15 or something of the list were about sexual immorality, works of the flesh included, things that, you know, come right to top of mind for anybody who lives in our culture today. But I'm pulling up Galatians 5 on my trusty iPad Pro, which I got in part because I saw you had one and I thought that would be really useful and it sure has been. And I have Logos Bible software on and it's fantastic. He says the the desires of the flesh, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, um, not surprised by those. But then he has at least five, and depending on how you count, I could get up to eight that fit into this category. Enmity, strife, jealousy, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. And if I want to toss in fits of anger, maybe I've got seven different works of the flesh that are all fo are, are focused on unjustified division <laughs> and mm -hmm. conscience issues figure hugely into that. If this is... Yeah, you did not miss that. That's not in our book. That's a fantastic observation. That should have been in there. Okay. Well done. Second edition. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a fantastic comment. Good observation. And, and when you contrast the fruit of the spirit, fruit singular of the spirit, uh, it contrasts with those significantly, doesn't it? Yeah, the gentleness uh, right. yeah, that you're called. So, so if I get the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit put together and I'm trying to apply this to conscience issues, I am looking, I am looking for unity. I might not be able to have it. There might be a first level issue involved here. We just can't, you know, set a fellowship at all. Um, but I, I'm actually gonna be trying, like my, my bias is actually pushing things down to that third level if I can. Do you think that's wise or should I be more careful than that? Okay, so the way you just said it, someone could misinterpret that to mean it's either first level or I push it down to third. So let me go back to the issue I raised earlier, which is uh, a book about the role of men and women in the church. That's so connected to a modern day controversy right now where there's this, in our culture, this uh, egalitarian androgenization impulse that just, just permeates our culture. And it's seeping into the church. Uh, is that a first level issue? Mm. Not necessarily, because I, I know I know godly uh, Christians who would identify as egalitarians or narrow complementarians. Uh, so I'm not questioning whether they're Christians, but what I am questioning is: is that healthy for a church, I, or does that just mean you know church leaders can disagree on that? It's not a gospel issue, so just chuck it in the third level. Right. There's something different about it that I don't think would make it a third level issue. I think we need to talk about it. It's a, it's a pressing cultural issue. It matters theologically, and yet it's not a first level issue. So, so that's why the second, the second level is important to sure, have. Sure, sure. And, and maybe the upshot is given the warnings against divisiveness and contention, given the praise of, that Jesus gives, blessed are the peacemakers, I'm going to be very careful about how I triage a given issue. Right. The, the, there right. really are high stakes when we're talking about conscience issues. That's right. good. I always enjoy fellowshipping with you, well, brother, so, of these things. Go let, ahead. Let me tell you how this works out in our church. So uh, our church... Uh, requires, we have a, doc, a doctrinal statement for the pastors. It's called our elder affirmation of faith. And it includes things like we're, we're Calvinists in the doctrine of salvation. We're Baptists in ecclesiology. We are complementarian in the roles of men and women in the church, th those sorts of issues. You can join our church and be an Arminian and an egalitarian, uh, it's, et cetera. You don't have to uh, sign up for all that to be a member. To be a member, there's a congregation affirmation of faith that's more bare bones kind of, you know, uh, uh, what, what John Stott would call basic Christianity type uh, doctrines. So we want ideally just about any Christian, I say just about any Christian because we have the one qualification you need to be baptized uh, and 
be immersed as a believer uh, to be a member of our church. But other than that, for the most part, it's all Christians. And yet at the same time, our church is teaching more than that. That's how, how we lead from the pulpit. That makes sense. Yeah, sure does. And, you know, Faith Life, the Bible study magazine, this podcast serves people far beyond the spectrum that you and I find ourselves in. One of the ways that I find, and I've thought about this so many times while working for an institution that serves a broad spectrum of believers, um, is that um, for the purposes of this institution, which is not a church, um, and serving all these people, the, one of the best things I can do is just stick as close as I can to direct Bible statements. And that is the way that I find that I can continue to serve them and not bring unnecessary division um, given the role that this institution is playing in Christ's body. But a church has a different role. I don't have a shepherding role over the people that listen to the Bible Study Magazine podcast. I don't know them all. I know very few of them. Right. Um, right. Faith Life, certainly. You know, that's not that's not what we're called to, but a church has a different calling. And therefore, those conscience issues and applying the Bible to them becomes even more important. When you're a shepherd watching the sheep being blown about by the various winds of doctrine, um, it's totally appropriate yeah. for you as an elder and a teacher in that institution to take this so seriously. You got it. Good. Thank you. So here's another longer quote. Um, I had so many, and I love um, reading on Logos, and I have to say on Kindle, because when I highlight something, it saves the highlight, and I go back to these things. So I'm going to quote you to yourself and get you to reflect on it a little bit. You or JD or both wrote, there's a misperception that conscience-related controversies occur only in strict churches, but really all of us are incurably judgmental. This goes back to something you're kind of saying just a little bit earlier. As creatures made in the image of a moral God, we are incapable of not making moral judgments. Whatever our situation, a church that thinks it has gotten beyond last generation's debates over music and wine will find that this generation's debates over recycling and child discipline are just as divisive. A believer who has prided himself on being generous on disputable matters will suddenly find himself judging a fellow believer who doesn't buy fair trade coffee. You said conscience issues will remain an important part of your personal life, your church life, and your ministry life for the rest of your life. Okay. Now, I've been your friend for a good long while, Andy, and one of the things that you do that I like so much that I think is humble and helpful is, you know, I, I would assume most people don't know this, even those who follow your ministry of writing writing and teaching and memorizing whole books of the Bible and reciting them, et cetera, et cetera, is every time you write something, it seems to me like you send it out to at least a couple dozen people to get their feedback if they're willing to give it. And usually I can do about half of your long article and I just have to move to other things, but I always love doing that. appreciate the way that you reach out. And now that I encourage you to get on Google Docs, I get to see the other people that you send stuff to. And I think yeah. it's very interesting there. Okay, so one thing that I've seen you do really helpfully, and I was, and I just wrote this on a comment on that very article you were talking about. Uh, I said, this is classic Andy. One thing you do is you analyze. You analyze the positions. And it seems to me that you're working very hard to represent people the way they would want to be represented, which is very tough to do in these conscience-related controversies, okay? Uh, I find that both sides or multiple sides in any given debate are trying to push their opponents into a ditch, both by the way they describe them and by the way they get them to respond. They, they just flame up so fast. I, I just wanted to ask you to explain um, to people listening to this podcast, watching this podcast, why do you bother? I mean, Twitter is a flame all the time. You could get more followers. I'm getting, I'm guessing you could, you know, really get uh, popular if you would just uh, flame people instead of carefully analyzing their positions on these difficult issues. Why do you bother? What motivates me is that I want to be a faithful, fruitful man of God. It, I, who cares about Twitter followers Amen. and all that? So when I, like when I chose to write that review article on man, manhood and womanhood, I initially did not want to write that because I, I knew I wouldn't like the book and it would be a, a largely negative review. What motivated me to write that is I'm a shepherd of a church where that viewpoint could could become more prominent and I want to prevent that. I want to shepherd. So a shepherd, we, we hear the term pastoral today and think it means nice. He's so pastoral. That means he's so nice. 
Okay, being pastoral includes being nice, but pastoral means shepherd-like. Shepherds kill lions and bears. They protect the sheep. So my my motivation is I want to be a faithful shepherd. So when I when I address an issue like that that's controversial, that's what's behind it. There's no motivation of I want more followers for, for no, not at all. And then this is just the golden rule. It's, it's very hard to do. Maybe I failed in this last review article is when you present someone else's position, you want them to be able to read it and say, yeah, that's my position. Um, I read Amy Bird's book three times before I even started writing the review. I wanted to get it right. Um, it's just that, that, that's how seriously I took that. Um, Tim Keller's a master at this, by the way. He'll when he's speaking to people who uh, who reject Christianity, he'll describe these beliefs they have better than they could articulate themselves. And as he's describing it, they're like, "Yeah, yeah, that's what I believe." And and, and it's called addressing defeater beliefs. You you address that, you explain it respectfully and correctly, and then you analyze. So it's it's just doing. If someone were to critique your view. Wouldn't you want them to yes. make make sure they understood it before they critiqued it? So that that's what's behind right. that. So when it comes to a conscience issue, if you have two people who are disagreeing, uh, rather than misrepresent one for the sake of the other one to win the argument, you want to be able to present the good reasons for both of them and weigh them. Yeah. You know, I've, I've actually been on the Mortification of Spin podcast that Amy is a host of yeah. and had yeah. a fine time. I was talking about my own Oh, book. they're delightful. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Gifted people that, that I profit from and have actually for many years. And I, you know, I'm in a somewhat awkward spot as a host of a podcast. You know, I don't want to divide my own audience unnecessarily. So right. I, want to, right. I want to talk to people on both sides of this divide that Andy is mentioning. And you can guess where I land. Uh, you can guess privately if you want or ask me questions privately, that'd be fine. But I want to observe something here that I saw that in Andy, he had read the book multiple times, clearly done so very carefully. And when my sister in Christ, Amy Bird, responded to Andy's uh, long response, one of the things she said that really heartened me, I think spoke well of her and of Andy, was at the beginning, she acknowledged that. This is somebody who tried really hard to represent me accurately. And as a writer who sometimes had to deal with controversial issues myself, and boy, the King James is a controversial issue, I can say that <laughs> I have real respect for some men uh, who disagree with me. I only mention men because it just ha so happens to be it's only men men. I haven't really heard from any women who've disagreed or not disagreed hardly at all. But um, I really respect these men because they listened and they represented me accurately. That to me is a great gift. When controversy, controversy over conscience issues tends to drive people away from one another and tends to inflame them and make them want to flame others, the spiritual gift of gentleness and loving your neighbor as yourself enough to listen to what they actually said, it, it really says to me that there's supernatural power there because I see that so seldom in this really polarized world. So I, I just want to thank you, Andy, that I sensed that spirit in you and you helped me understand um, viewpoints that I hadn't really accurately described before. Um, let me just kind of wind things up with um, an offer to you to go to the final stage of the homiletical process as taught to us by the pastor that used to pastor us both. He said it's explanation, illustration, application, then argumentation, which kind of argues for the validity of your application, then exhortation. If somebody studies the conscience, they want to apply the Bible accurately and faithfully and lovingly and gently um, to whatever issue the Lord has brought to, to their life of sanctification. What would you exhort them to do? <laughs> Even coming away from this conversation, yeah. what would you exhort them to do? I'd start by saying, uh, I think in concentric circles, so start with yourself. So you and your conscience, don't think about other, other people, just you first. Never sin against your conscience. So that sense of that internal voice or sense you have of what's right and wrong, never go against that. Uh, that that's a gift from God. It's it's like 
touching a hot stove and you immediately pull your hand back, you've got this nervous system that's protecting you from being burned. Your conscience is like that. It protects you from doing harm to yourself. Don't sin against your conscience. And then as you work out from there, um, when you do feel tremendous guilt, as you should as a sinner, don't let that make you wallow in despair, but flee to Christ as the one who can carry that for you and takes care of that guilt. Uh, this is where I, imputation, uh, the imputation of Christ's righteousness to our account is so Praise important. Uh, I, I have a, a section in the book where I talk about John Bunyan's autobiography and how that's in Pilgrim's Progress represented when, when Christian battles Apollyon and how that's reflected in my favorite hymn, Before the Throne of God Above, stanza two, as we, we look to Christ. Uh, our sins are, are, are bad. They're, they're worse than we recognize, but Christ is greater. So then working out from ourselves to other people, my exhortation to you as you interact with other people is don't lead other people to sin against their consciences and to respect them and love them in your differences. And as is appropriate, it's okay to talk about your differences, but do it with a gracious spirit that prioritizes love between each other over who's right and who's wrong. Praise God. And right now we're recording this in mid-May 2020. November is coming up in America where there's an, another political election. So here's here's an opportunity to apply it to your fellow church members who might not agree eye to eye on various political issues. Yeah, that that is timely. I don't know exactly when this will release. And even then, I don't know when people will listen to it. Very possibly, very likely, somebody will listen to this just before they're about to flame somebody else on social media. And hmm. may they consider theological triage and careful application of the Bible to conscience issues before they do so. Andy, thank you so much for the gift that you are and have given to the church and your diligent work over these many years. I'm going to tell you a little story before we uh, wrap up that I don't think I've ever told you before, but um, you you have a reputation. Don't get a big head here, Andy, but um, you have a reputation for your diligence. And one time in seminary, I told your sister, I said, ah, man, I just, I just I feel kind of put to shame by Andy. And she looked at me in the eyes and she said, we don't need everybody to be an Andy. And I thought, that is both a praise of you and an encouragement to me. Over the years, that had just freed me totally to not to not feel like this is a competition, but to feel like, wow, I am so grateful for the gifts that God has given to the church. And um, your work repeatedly has been that for me. So thank you, brother. And thank you for coming on the Bible Study Magazine podcast. My pleasure. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for joining us for the Bible Study Magazine podcast. Our audio video technicians are Jack Underwood and Brandon Van Beek. I'm your host, Mark Ward, Editor-in-Chief of Faith Life's Bible Study Magazine. And if you want more insights like those you heard from my respected friend, Andy, I hope you will subscribe to the Bible Study Magazine podcast or to the magazine itself. We're here to help you study the Bible with the best tools available.